Good morning, everybody. And uh, as a prelude to the uh, Grand Rounds this morning, I would like to just go over a couple things. The Grand Rounds this morning is so special that we had to restrict access to the tunnel. So uh, hope, hopefully uh, everyone will find their way over here eventually. And I'm proud to say that our guest speakers football team won last night. And so we're uh, off to a good start. I, I would just like to spend a minute or two highlighting a few things from the past month with respect to our foundation that uh, Dr. Mike Miedema received the uh, Early Distinguished Career Award at the University of Minnesota. I think the award was in October, and that was based on his community service and his research efforts. That uh, we had a great uh, impact at the American Heart Association and the TCT meetings, 37 physicians and MHIF staff members, a variety of presentations from the uh, detection and prevention of coronary disease by Dr. Lesser and uh, uh, Miedema, and then the treatment of, of coronary disease at TCT with Dr. Berlakis and then bowel disease with, the, with Paul Saraja. Uh, at the uh, gala, min, many of you were there at the gala, but Dave Hurl received the um, Ray Bantal Distinguished Service Award, and Paul received the uh, Robert Hauser Leadership Award. So congratulations to both of those physicians. And then uh, a special notice to, uh, with respect to Steve Bradley, uh, JAMA, the JAMA um, family of uh, journals has uh, started a new journal called JAMA Network Open. Uh, since uh, in the past eight years, the number of submissions to the JAMA journal has, uh, manuscript submissions has gone from 9,000 to 16,000. And the number of published manuscripts has actually dropped from 1,900 to 1,300. So the competition for publication is fierce. And in response to this, they started a new open access journal, multidisciplinary. And Paul or uh, Steve is going to be the one of eight associate editors, the only one from Minnesota and the only cardiologist. So if you see Steve, give him a big shout out. And uh, finally, one important note: the the gala was quite successful. We raised $150,000 for an uh, investigator-initiated uh, research. So with those uh, highlights, I'll invite Paul to introduce our uh, grand round speaker. Good morning, everyone, and uh, hope you all had a great Thanksgiving, and uh, glad you made it through the tunnel uh, to get here. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker. Um, whenever Jolene comes up here, I always feel a little nervous. <laughs> uh, our first speaker is Dr. Cavalcante, who uh, was born in Brazil. Uh, did his uh, medical school in uh, Fortaleza, is that right? And uh, learned last night that Brazil has a soccer team uh, and that they play uh, Mario Gessel's Germans every now and then. And so uh, um, he uh, finishes a medical uh, school there and then came to Henry Ford Hospital where he did his residency uh, fellowship uh, in cardiology and then went to the Cleveland Clinic uh, where he did his uh, advanced imaging uh, fellowship for two years, I believe, right? And then uh, Dr. Cavalcante is now at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, where he's the director of structural imaging and also the co-director for uh, the Mitral Valve Center. And uh, Dr. Cavalcante is obviously a world-renowned uh, speaker uh, with expertise in imaging uh, for valvular heart disease, and it's our distinguished pleasure to uh, have him come. So, go on. Thank you, Paul, so much for the kind introduction. Um, and indeed, the talk about last night was, you know, how is Brazil going to defeat Germany again or not? You know, and had to, you know, trying to justify how this happened because it was a, a very sore day for us. But you know, as any Brazilians, we have a lot of resilience, and even the console from the Germans, you know, is something that we'll still hope to keep it up for next year. And I hope that we have a better success. But over the next 40 minutes or so, I hope to cover these four aspects that uh, our group has been uh, working on, particularly focused with uh, aortic stenosis. But that's not to say that this cannot be applicable to other valvular heart disease. And uh, true honor to be such um, in, in this uh, present time here at this institution that has made its name and its um, really impact in lots of publications that you know really cherish. Um, so starting with myocardial vascular disease, 
in uh, aortic stenosis. You know, definitely we know that calcific aortic stenosis is a progressive disease. Uh, we know that it starts at some point, and there are some uh, special groups, particularly in those that have some uh, predisposition to have the you know, genetic mutation into lipoprotein seems to carry an increased risk for development of calcification. Once it starts, we don't know how to stop that. But you know, definitely we ended up with this phenotype here of the severe calcific aortic stenosis with restricted opening and increased pressure overload over time. Our current guidelines uh, pre, you know, propose that we should consider aortic valve replacement in the presence of severe aortic stenosis, which now has changed over time. It used to be 0.8 or so, and now has changed to less than 1, and now less than equal than 0.1. So we're going to have more of these low gradient aortic stenosis because the cutoff has kept rising. So severe AF has to be present as well. Evidence of decompensation from that aortic stenosis from this adaptive hypertrophic response either by the presence of symptoms, which is quite difficult, as we know, in these elderly patients that have multitude of comorbidities, but also the presence of LV impairment, which we still use a parameter of ejection fraction less than 50% to indicate the presence of this LV impairment, which sometimes can be late and irreversible. We learn also in medical school that this LV hypertrophy is an adaptive mechanism. As the pressure rises into the left ventricle from the progressive increase after load from the severe aortic stenosis, the ventricle should remodel and should increase its wall thickness because by increasing the wall thickness will reduce the wall stress and try to compensate for that over time. But this myocardial response is actually quite heterogeneous and variable. And there are several patterns that actually take place in the presence of severe aortic stenosis. And we will look at just the correlation of aortic valve area as a parameter of aortic stenosis severity. It is pretty much a I mean, there is no correlation whatsoever between the LV mass <coughs> index and the aortic valve stenosis to indicate that the severity of AF does not explain entirely the hemodynamics, the remodeling process that takes place, and by that consequence, the prognosis, as we will see. So we're trying to deconstruct so that we can construct a better framework on how we should approach this disease. This is a publication that's still in press from the group in, uh, the, um, in London by uh, James Moon. 168 patients, all with severe aortic stenosis. There was no gender difference in the valve stenosis severity. And what they saw by the camera of MRI is that women and men remodel differently. And we see that women tend to have more of a normal geometry and concentric remodeling. The men that have more of this pronounced concentric hypertrophy or even eccentric hypertrophy, that seems to be associated with a morphine type of decreased ejection fraction increase in biomarkers and myocardial fibrosis. So is this adaptation really compensatory? Is this something that is benign? And are we using different thresholds? Should we have individualized thresholds for men and women? We don't consider that. But that puts us to think about that we should perhaps consider that this remodeling process is quite unique. Because of this uniqueness, we try to now understand what really drives that. And there is a multitude of other factors that take place into this pressure overload phenomenon. You know, changes in the myocardial mechanics, with changes in the strain, as we will see, which decrease the mortality. There's left ventricular hypertrophy, which is related to the increased afterload, not only from the valve, but also from the arteries. The arterial stiffness, systemic hypertension, creating diastolic heart failure, and ultimately, this myocardial cell death and fibrosis, which is going to be very important to send the message and when we should consider to look into this ventricle. Propose that, you know, this talk was going to be focused on the MRI, uh, you know, as a, a framework to understand better this myocardial response. As we can look at the function and the structural remodeling, we can quantify that reliably and consistently. We can look at the aortic valve morphology as well, the flow and the velocities, and assess coronary artery disease, the presence of coronary artery disease, which is common in these patients with myocardial stress perfusion. We can also have 3D data sets similar to CT without the need of contrast that we can use for uh, measurement as well, similar to CT. The development of 4D uh, flow CMR now allows us to obtain this entire data set pre-breathing, and we can do any multiplane and reformat and reconstruction after the patient is gone with the trade-off of uh, spatial and temporal resolution. But I think where MRI really earns its money is for this unique capability of this tissue characterization. Be that with the replacement fibrosis with late gadolinium enhancement, 
with the development of the interstitial fibrosis with the measurement of the extracellular volume uh, by T1 mapping pre and post contrast, as well as in the identification of other comorbidities and uh, phenotypes such as the cardiac amyloidosis, which could be prevalent in this patient. Moving beyond ejection fraction as what the guidelines have recognized for the development or the trigger point for the um, uh, triggering of surgery, we can do that with echocardiogram, um, depending on the echo image quality. Longitudinal strain seems to be the one that is the most susceptible for the subendocardial fibers. The heart twists in several ways. There is the longitudinal way, there is the radial way, which is what we depicted here, and the circumferential strain. And there's the interplay between these three strains, which, which promotes really the contractile process. We can do this by echocardiogram and by the CMR now, which is much more easy uh, to be done with the feature tracking, which is depicted here. And why is this strain an important parameter, although it has its limitations as well? Because looking at the strain, we will understand that once this remodeling process takes place, we can see that despite the ejection fraction, become, it still remains preserved, as we can see the ejection fraction in the presence of severe axonosis is going to be preserved. The wall thickness has increased, but the longitudinal shortening has decreased. So if we just look at the ejection fraction, that is not going to be different, yet the strain is going to change because now with the remodeling, the ventricle cannot shorten in the longitudinal aspect of it. And that has been shown by the group from the Netherlands a few years ago that as the aortic stenosis progresses, the ejection fraction does not change, yet the strain decreases. And longitudinal is going to be more negative. The closer to zero, the worse, because you wanted to shorten a little bit. The circumferential strain, the same thing, and the radio wanted to be positive. So there is a decrease in the strain as the stenosis progresses. And there are some small studies showing that there is a prognostic value to assess that in patients that are asymptomatic in the presence of preserved ejection fraction that they can separate those that could be. And it adds prognostic value as well on the top of SPS from valve calcification, uh, arterial impedance, and many other parameters. However, the strain has some caveat. First, we need to have adequate image quality. And we see that sometimes with elderly patients, it's difficult to have them move around and image quality can be at play. We cannot do in the presence of contrast. Patients with a fast heart rate and atrial fibrillation, also we cannot do a good job with the strain. And also strain is affected by the afterload. As any contractor process is preload and afterload dependent, as shown by this graph here, showing that with an increased strain here in the white bars, we can have a decreased radial circumferential and longitudinal strain. So, and we see that frequently. A patient we had last week had you know, severe aortic stenosis, bona fide ejection fraction of 60%, the normal strain should be around minus 20. His strain was pre-taver minus 16. He gets taver 48 hours before he goes home. His strain moved from minus 16 to minus 22. So what does that change, that 6% change? It's probably a lot of that is after load. It's not so much ventricular fibrosis as some other studies have indicated. But myocardial fibrosis is an important, uh, the presence of myocardial fibrosis in this patient is an important prognostic value, it provides a prognostic value. Either the presence of subendocardial infarct, such as coronary artery disease, as we can see here, or this punctate midwall myocardial fibrosis seems to carry the same prognosis. Midwall fibrosis, once present, despite the aortic valve replacement, carries an important hazard ratio. And it doesn't matter whether it's infarct or midwall, this is an important signature of the ventricle of its suffering. And it's interesting, when you read this paper in more detail, they say that more than one half of the patients that had midwall fibrosis that died, actually they had moderate aortic stenosis. So we're waiting for the patients to have symptoms, we're waiting for the ejection fraction to decrease, and we're waiting for the valve to become severe so that we can intervene into the valve replacement when that process might have started even earlier. This signal has uh, been presented now into a, this large registry from UK, both showing in TAVI or in SAVR patients, the presence of late gadolinium enhancement has a increase um, in a worse prognosis signal. And the separation here in, in TAVR is even more striking. And to take this to the next level, the group by Edinburgh led by Mark Dweck has now been testing this on a prospective manner in this evolved study, taking patients that are asymptomatic with severe AS, with preserved gradients, high gradients, 
and they're going to be screening for the compensation with high sensitivity troponin and EKG, put through their camera of MRI. If they have mid-wall fibrosis, then they're going to be randomized. Intervene, either by surgery or TAVR, or wait and wait for them to have symptoms and then intervene. And it's with that that we're going to be able to prove that this intervention at an earlier stage, now I would say that even before the development of myocardial fibrosis would be ideal, but that the presence of myocardial fibrosis at the trigger point before the development of symptoms is going to tell us a lot about how we can have even better outcomes for this patient. I've been talking about the late gadolinium enhancement, which is this replacement fibrosis, a scar. We need to have a black to see what it's white. But when everything is gray, such as in the diffuse interstitial expansion, we need to use other metrics, such as the extracellular volume fraction, which is a measurement of the fibrosis, as I will show. This concept of cardiac cirrhosis has been proposed 25 years ago. Pathologists here, I remember, have said that you know, in this low magnification, these findings of increasing interstitial space are reminiscent of cirrhosis at low power. And we tend to use the, you know, the, the process of interstitial lung disease, but we don't talk about interstitial heart disease. And this is truly what it is, you know, and it's bona fide uh, pictorial here. We see that patients that are normal and patients with severe oryx stenosis, they have this interstitial expansion that not all the time is going to be reversible despite the successful aortic valve replacement. And now we have methods that we can use um, routinely in our uh, CMR lab to really measure this interstitial expansion with the use of extracellular volume fraction. It has been validated against biopsy by two independent groups with good correlation. And our group at Pittsburgh has been one of the pioneers of using this metric here in the general population, unselected population that go in CMR, and they saw that there, there were tertiles of ECV. The worse ECV or the higher burden of fibrosis, the worse the outcomes, which added was had an incremental value beyond age, CAD, ejection fraction, and any other comorbidity. So measuring is not so much about the ejection fraction, it's not so much of the strain, it's measuring the fibrotic process that now it will take place. And the guidelines uh, recently by this expert consensus that was published earlier this year have indicated that CMR could be helpful in the identification of these cardiomyopathies and the imaging for myocardial fibrosis and SCAR. And this recent publication from the, the Edinburgh group, um, I really like it because they took one step back in terms of understanding this process of remodeling in aortic stenosis. These are all patients that had aortic stenosis to several degrees. And using T1 mapping and ECV, they divided this into three groups. Patients that have normal myocardium, be that with the extracellular volume less than 23%. This extracellular expansion that we talked about before, with the increase greater than 23. And this other patient that we talked even before was this replacement fibrosis, when you have late gadolinium enhancement. And what they saw was that there is definitely a different uh, survivorship according to where do these patients fall. Patients with normal myocardium have much better than those that have replacement fibrosis. But those with the extracellular expansion already don't have the same benign course that patients that would have the normal myocardium. And you could see that Yes, there is a, low, a lot of overlap between patients with mild, moderate, and severe. You can say, how good is your parameter? How good is that parameter for us to track response? But if you look at it, in patients that have moderate theoretic stenosis, there are those that already have the extracellular expansion. And those would be the ones that I would subject that perhaps we should consider to focus on and to look at. In the same way that those patients that have severe aortic stenosis, some of them have not yet increased their extracellular volume fraction. And those patients, we could potentially continue to monitor um, sequentially for them. So it's not so much about the aortic stenosis severity, but rather how the ventricle responds to that and imparted from valvular disease. The other thing that's also important to consider into this construct is the importance of arterial stiffness, because once we replace the valve, the ventricle will feel that. And this is um, you know, characterized by this global load. But taking one step beyond is measuring how stiff these arteries are. And the Wincastle principle um, defines as that the arteries should have enough distensibility and compliance that at each systolic load, they should be able to accommodate the pulsatility. And in diastole, they should be able to um, squeeze it back. So in systole, they would expand. 
and propel the, the blood forward, which is going to be split, and in the acetylene, they should continue to squeeze. With an increased atherosclerosis and hypertension, there's going to be increased collagen deposition and vessel calcification. The arteries will, will become stiffer, the compliance is going to be reduced, and the blood is going to travel much faster. The pulse wave velocity is going to increase because it's going to be a lead pipe. And therefore, the reflected waves back to the ventricle as well. You want to have hypertension and decreased your reservoir. CMR, we can do that. We can do that also with tonometry, with applanation tonometry. We can do uh, carotid femoral pulse wave velocity. But with MR, we can also measure at any given point. We can measure the arch, the descending, the entire aorta by looking at the time peak and doing that with phase encoded velocity. We tested that prospectively on a trial that now the results we uh, have just submitted and it's under review uh, in Jack looking at the impact of arterial stiffness and this wave reflection as determinants of the left ventricular hypertrophy. So all these patients had severe aortic stenosis. They underwent cardiac MRI, tonometry questionnaire, a quality of life questionnaire. They underwent valve replacement and six months after they underwent the same investigation. And our hypothesis was the following, that the wave reflection in this arterial stiffness is going to be an important determinant of how this heart is going to remodel despite having a successful AVR. So having the AVR is one thing, but how the ventricle is going to remodel in the myocardial fibrotic process is going to be interlinked between the arteries. We did this very comprehensive uh, phenotypic characterization, T1 mapping pre and post pulse wave velocity, and we'll look at this parameter here of the reflection magnitude which is when the blood travels outward because of the stiffness is going to be reflecting in diastole, and the ventricle is going to feel that. And we did tonometry as well. And what we saw is that, as many other studies have shown, is that after you do the valve replacement, the, ventric the ventricular mass should regress. That's expected, right? You have relieved the after load, and the ventricular mass goes down. But this mass going down is predominantly cellular the cellular mass, so the myocytes reduce in their size. However, the extracellular mass, which was that myriad of collagen that we showed before, it does not change at all in such a way that the extracellular volume fraction that we talked about remains exactly constant. So once that fibrotic process is there, you can't retrieve it back. And what we saw is that a big determinant of that extracellular mass was actually the reflection magnitude, that crosstalk between the ventricle and the artery when they eject. And the arterial stiffness actually in the compliance of the order changes after sever. And this was uh, quite surprising for us. Uh, after, before AVR and after AVR, the thoracic pulse wave velocity, either by MRI or by tonometry, it increased. So the arteries, I'm not so sure that they would become stiffer. They're probably stiffer to begin with. We just unmask that after you open the valve. And we can see that sometimes you do tavern, the patients now become hypertensive. And you're like, whoa, 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 where did this come from? You know, and that, that's probably a reflection of part of that. The compliance goes down, the stiffness goes up. And this reflection magnitude, which was that parameter that we checked, was associated with the improvement on the Kansas City uh, cardiomyopathy questionnaire. Um, and importantly, the change in the Kansas City questionnaire was reduced in the presence of a higher uh, reflection magnitude. So we need to not only target the valve, but also we need to look at the artery to understand how this ventricle will respond at the successful AVR. The paravalvular leak is another topic as well that has gotten much better. But before that, we need to understand that with the CMR, we can do a very uh, good um, phenotypic characterization of the 3D data set. Uh, we can use this with a non-contrast free breathing. We trigger according to the EKG and to the diaphragmatic motion. We can do this reconstruction in any given software. We can calculate the annulus. And this has been shown to have a strong correlation with CT. And this has become actually the method of choice for us in patients that have advanced chronic kidney disease that cannot receive contrast. Uh, GFR below 30, we typically do a non-contrast CMR and we fuse that with the CT. With the same data set, we can use, uh, this is circle, uh, showing that we can find a coplanar angle uh, of implant similar to what we got in CT, perimeter, area, um, and many other things and simulate the prosthesis. One of the limitations, obviously, with uh, cardiac MRI is that we cannot see calcium well, but if we have a co-registration of a non-contrast CT with the cardiac MRI, then we can have both the anatomical information as well 
is the structural and the distribution of calcium, which would be important to understand for the parabola reef. And the guidelines now, the expert consensus have now put forward that you know this use of this free breathing non-contrast navigator gated is an important measurement that could be used for patients with a certain chronic kidney disease. In terms of the parabola leak, that has definitely gotten better over the years with iteration on the devices, iteration on the prosthesis, delivery systems, and the understanding that the sizing of the prosthesis was much better done with the use of the CT. But it remains quite challenging on how we quantify paravalvular leak. You know, between uh, me and Richard, for example, we're looking at the same you know, valve, and depending on the image quality, we might come up with different severities of a paravalvular leak. And there have been attempts to use a more granular scheme up to seven categories uh, for paravalvular leak with multitude of parameters. We don't have a hierarchy. Which one should be the one that really dictates? Sometimes the circumferential extent has been used, but it has no validation. And there is still a very high intra-observer variability, which was shown by this recent publication comparing the partner to B group from two core labs. It doesn't matter where we use four categories or seven categories. The kappa, the agreement between the two uh, readers is quite poor. So the better refinement of that needs to take place. In some selected cases, we had used the cardiac MRI for that. In patients that we have difficult windows that remain still symptomatic, we take uh, them to the magnet, as we can show here, two different patients, one with a balloon expandable sapien XT with, uh, with CHF symptoms, and you can see that there are two jets of paravalvular leak here, as well as in this patient with a 31 uh, core valve, one month post cover with significant um, heart failure symptoms. And this is just a through plane phase contrast immediately below the prosthesis. But what we typically do is to measure the flow above the prosthesis. That's much more reproducible and uh, reliable. And with that, we can calculate what is the forward flow, what goes out in systole, and what comes back down in diastole. This patient here, the ascending aorta had whole diastolic backward flow even present in the descending thoracic aorta with a significant regurgitant fraction. And this has been shown by a recent publication from uh, Redes Cabal group taking three centers. They had a echo done at six days post hour versus a CMR done at 40 days. And what they were sh what they shown here, predominantly balloon expendable valves, was that echo severity of paravalvular leak was not able to stratify adequately the risk for all cause mortality hospitalization for CHF. Whereas cardiac MRI with a regurgitant fraction greater than 30% was able to identify these patients that would be at a higher risk for either valve intervention, valve and valve intervention, paravalvular leak uh, uh, closure, uh, or even increased risk of death. And this is by looking at the camera of cardiac MRI, uh, they found that this moderate to severe is up to 13%. So this might be a helpful to be used in a certain group of patients that will still have difficulty to determine the severity of paravalvular leak. And this was the impetus to have this uh, tested prospectively at two time points with the class MR study that we have started um, in uh, this past summer with a hypothesis that the paravalvular leak assessed by cardiac MRI would have a lower both intra and inter observer variability compared to echocardiography with several uh, secondary aims to look at the changes of paravalvular leak over time and to look at the paravalvular leak impact into the ventricular remodeling and the regression of hypertrophy. And this is a trial that we are doing together with Matt Diss as well as the Quebec group with uh, Philippe Pibaro and uh, Redes Cabal, looking at two time points, post ever with the CMR and CT, as well as blood work, to try to understand this paravalvular leak get better, what happens to that, what is related to it, what is the better metric that we can use, what is the threshold that we're going to use, and so far, you know, we have enrolled 20 patients into the study, and we're looking forward to have, you know, more data to come in the next couple of years to better understand that. Switching gears now to the right side, we were looking at how the ventricle responds on the left, but it's also important to look at the right side because it will tell us a lot of how the prognosis is. This is a prognostic ventricle, if you will. We looked at this group of patients with low flow, low gradient severe aortic stenosis. These are patients that are quite complex and difficult to deal. They can, they can have coronary artery disease. They have depressed ejection fraction. They have depressed mean gradient. 
and the low valve area, typically the butamine stress echo is the way to do it to assess whether they have flow reserve or contractile reserve and how severe the aortic stenosis is. We're looking at the butamine stress echo. If they have an increase in the stroke volume greater than 20%, they would have presence of flow reserve. And that indicates that they would have a better uh, outcome going through surgical ABR. In terms of TAVR nowadays, we don't know if this is really important. It should still proceed with that. In the presence of severe aortic stenosis, TAVR or SAVR, high-risk TAVR should be considered. In the presence of pseudo-severe aortic stenosis, that is, you increase the stroke volume, the dobutamine with the stroke volume, the valve opens up and the gradients remain low, they would have pseudo-severe. They would have moderate aortic stenosis. At that time that this was um, designed here by Dr. Pibaro in 2012, they said medical therapy. But now we have a trial. We have the TAVR Unload study, which is now being sponsored by Edwards, which is testing the hypothesis that by relieving the after load in the presence of even moderate aortic stenosis and LV dysfunction, you might be doing some good. That needs to be obviously confirmed, but that's the hypothesis behind of trying to intervene in these patients, even with moderate aortic stenosis. What we looked was the impact of right ventricular function using a simple parameter, which has its limitations, but also it has its prognostic value in the pH literature in pulmonary hypertension, which is the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, or TAPC, which is the longitudinal movement of the RV in terms of its longitudinal axis. And what we saw was that in this group of patients with low flow, low gradient, is that the presence of RV dysfunction was common. About 35% of them would have that. And the prognostic value of the presence of RV dysfunction was much more important than flow reserve in the pulmonary hypertension itself than the injection fraction. And patients that had RV dysfunction and received no AVR obviously had the worst survivorship. But even those that had RV dysfunction and received AVR, the survivorship was no different in those that had no RV dysfunction. So we need to look at the right ventricle to understand also how we can better tell the patients what are their risks uh, for undergoing this procedure. And perhaps TAVR definitely should be a better way because there is less RV injury, uh, less RV suffering than the surgical AVR. And despite multiple adjustments here, either from SPS, uh, global longitudinal strain, tricuspid regurgitation, many other things, the hazard ratio for RV dysfunction was strongly associated with mortality. And it's interesting to see that your work is also reproduced uh, by other groups independently, by the group Felipe Barreau a few weeks after, had shown the same thing using a different parameter of RV longitudinal strain, showing the same Kaplan-Meier curves that RV longitudinal strain also is quite important for the survivorship of these patients with low flow, low gradient. Now, the RV working or dysfunction of the RV is not independent. One thing that we need to understand is obviously is the pulmonary hypertension that it's quite common in these patients. And depending on how we define pulmonary hypertension, the threshold that we use, we can find from anywhere between 28 to 56 percent. Several definitions have been accounted, but all of them carrying the same message in this meta-analysis that once it's present, it's bad and cavern. And this expert consensus have indicated that we should look into pulmonary hypertension as an important comorbidity, although that's not included in the SPS and the societal thoracic surgery. We should look into the evaluation of pulmonary hypertension by echocardiography. One question that we had is that how good is echo to assess, to identify severity of pulmonary hypertension. We do echoes, and that's what I do for a living as well. But in terms of the severity of pulmonary hypertension, that's not as good as we thought. These are patients, 86 patients from our group, done at the same day, right heart cath, transthoracic echocardiography. And we can see, yes, there is a correlation, but that correlation is not so good. That's why we need to look into details. Out of these 27 patients that were found to have no pulmonary hypertension by echo, Four of them had moderate, four of them had severe. And 50% of them got reclassified into severe. Take, for example, these patients that had 10 patients here that the echo called mild or no pulmonary hypertension, they were found to have severe pulmonary hypertension by right heart cath. And we use right heart cath to treat and to evaluate the severity of pulmonary hypertension for these patients when we deal with, um, you know, PAH. But for TAVR patients, we you know, we have been doing this, and we're fortunate to have this data. We have been doing right heart caps beforehand as means to not only evaluate the severity, but also to track the response to that after TAVR. This is a paper that was published uh, 
few years ago from the group in the Switzerland showing that, you know, depending on the hemodynamic classification of the pulmonary hypertension, there's going to be a different mortality. Well, patients with this combined pH of pre- and post-capillary, that means that they would have increased bar, uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, they would have increased wedge. They have this more, you know, more advanced phenotype in which there is a change in the pulmonary vasculature, and this pulmonary hypertension might not improve completely after CAVR. And this is a question that was brought by the group at the Cleveland Clinic looking at surgical ADR, what happens with the pulmonary hypertension severity. We know that baseline pulmonary hypertension is bad, but what happens after the intervention is extremely important as well, because we, these patients might still be at risk. And what they have shown is that, yes, there is a decline, and the higher you are, the greater the fall, but over time, this pulmonary hypertension creeps up again. And Mario had written a nice uh, editorial piece at the Circa Interventions a few years ago with the Mayo Clinic group talking exactly about the, the assessment and evaluation of pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this is a, something that we um, got published recently from our group and the TAVR group, uh, at that time 500 patients. We look at how prevalent pulmonary hypertension is by Reihard Cap, and 67%, it's very common. Two thirds of these patients would have pulmonary hypertension. And because we don't do Reihard Cap systematically after TAVR, we use ECHO as a metric for this persistency of pulmonary hypertension. And we had to come up with a cutoff. We used a cutoff of greater than 45, greater than 45 millimeters of mercury was indicative of persistency of pulmonary hypertension. And the good news is that not all the patients that have pulmonary hypertension would actually would persist to have pulmonary hypertension. Two-thirds of them actually have improved pulmonary hypertension. And a third of them will persist to have pulmonary hypertension. Those that have the residual tend to have more comorbidities, as one would expect higher burden of atrial fibrillation, worse STS score. They tend to have, obviously, also concomitant valvular disease, although not all the patients would have moderate to CVM RTR, but they have a higher burden of that. They have greater atria, and they have worse diastolic function by EA ratio. By hemodynamics, they tend to also have a greater pulmonary pressure at baseline, a greater mean PA pressure, and you can see that the PVR is not dramatically, uh, slightly greater in this patient, implying that they have more remodeling. And you see that the TPG is also greater for this patient, so that more combined pre- and post-capillary phenotype. And what we can see is that, you know, at two-year survival shift, is that for those patients that had no baseline pulmonary hypertension, the survival shift at two years was 15%. And this is the solid black line. Those that have baseline pulmonary hypertension, you did the TAVR, pulmonary hypertension improved, you can see that they have exactly the same survival. They fall back into the same line. So TAVR actually does a great job into fixing some patients with pulmonary hypertension, at least in the short term. But those that had persistent pulmonary hypertension, even short term, one month after, had worse survivorship. And this was dictated by the presence of some of the other concomitant valve disease that we need to understand better worse diastolic dysfunction, and high burden of atrial fibrillation, which might be the more advanced phenotype of aortic stenosis when the disease really moves beyond just the left ventricle, left atrium, right ventricle, and many other things. And this was persistent despite several adjustments here. Such way that we need to understand and frame this better. By the time this aortic stenosis moves from the left to the pulmonary circulation to the right heart, we might be acting too late. It might, might be an advanced stage or more advanced class of the disease. We don't need to wait for that. And that's sometimes when patients present to us. And to finalize, talking about the aortic stenosis and age and comorbidities, this is a recent work that we are um, happy to uh, present to you, uh, that cardiac amyloidosis is now being diagnosed much more commonly. And it's not as rare as once thought. And now with the aging of the population, this transthyretin wild type cardiac amyloidosis is going to be the most common one in concomitant clinicians. It's also called a senile systemic amyloidosis. And this is thanks to the development of a lot of echocardiography using longitudinal strain. We can find this relative apical sparing. The strain in the apical segments is much better than the base and mid segment. The development of use of technician pyrophosphate. This has been around for more than 30 years. Very cheap isotope that has a very avid uptake to the cardiac myocytes. 
as well as the use of cardiac MRI with the late gadolinium enhancement. We can see this replacement fibrosis. You can see in the autopsy studies in the Finnish population, 25% of them were found to have cardiac amyloidosis. And using this uh, DPD, which is the different tracer that they have in Europe, in an unselected population of HASPAP, 13% of them were found to have. That's not uncommon. In the TAVR world, there are a couple of studies that have shown that in autopsy studies in TAVR, about a third of the patients were found to have cardiac amyloidosis. In this recent publication from a couple weeks ago from the Columbia Group, tested systematically, 150 patients had received TAVR, and within 30 days after TAVR, everybody got a PYP scan. They found 16% of these patients had cardiac amyloidosis. That's not rare. That means that one in six patients actually will have cardiac amyloidosis. And the majority of these patients are males, 92%. They have this heart failure, mid-range ejection fraction, which is this new category. There's a lot of debate. And finally, we found a bucket for them. They have this low flow, low gradient AS phenotype, of which was 3.7 times more common. So although this paper was quite important to tell us, hey, this is not uncommon, we should be aware of that, and we should think about cardiac amyloidosis, it did not tell us yet what the outcomes were. When will you find aortic stenosis in cardiac amyloidosis? We decided to look into this. Uh, we're using a different camera cardiac MRI, using late gadolinium enhancement as a metric to evaluate the diffuse enhancement typical for cardiac amyloidosis. And with the hypothesis that the overlap, obviously, of cardiac amyloidosis and AS would be associated with the worse survivorship than patients with isolated aortic stenosis. This was a retrospective study, three years. The common reasons for the CMR performance were bicuspid valves with stenosis and orthopathy, LV dysfunction to evaluate myocardial fibrosis, cardiomyopathy viability, or also some red flags on the echocardiogram that were concerning for that. And we did a typical gadolinium enhancement 15 minutes after the injection using state sensitive inversion recovery, and survival analysis was tested. Let me take you to the results. So we found nine out of 113 patients, that's 8% all comers, that had severe AS and cardiac amyloidosis. If we filter by the median age of 74, which was the median age for this entire cohort, we found the prevalence of about 16%, which is exactly the same that they found in the Columbia group. None of our patients that had aortic stenosis and cardiac amyloidosis were below the age of 80. This is an octogenarian story here. And as you can see, there's a predominant male, uh, predominance of males here, high burden of, aortic, of atrial fibrillation, and a higher SPS. Five out of these nine patients received TAVR. The other four patients, once we conveyed the diagnosis, they said, enough is enough. We don't want it to undergo this. By looking at the cardiac MR, this is a patient with severe aortic stenosis. This is a patient with severe AS and cardiac amyloidosis. You can see that they're completely different. Nice, dark, black, null myocardium without any replacement fibrosis and the other one with diffuse interstitial fibrosis, pericardial fusion, atrial fibrillation, and tight valves. They are thicker ventricles, they have bigger atria, they have lower longitudinal function in the S prime. They have the decreased stroke volume, this low flow phenotype, both by echo as well as by MRI. They have more low flow, low gradient physiology, and a greater mass as you would expect. After a medium follow-up of 18 months and 40 deaths occurred, we can see that patients with aortic stenosis and cardiac amyloidosis had a remarkable worse survivorship than those that had the aortic stenosis. And 56% versus 20% at one year. And this persisted despite adjustment for several other comorbidities and other parameters. SPS, which takes into account more than 40 variables, AVR, ejection fraction, New York Heart Association, the hazard ratio was about the same. It did not matter. Once it was present, this indicated a worse prognosis. Obviously, this is a single center with a relative small size. We did not do biopsies in these elderly folks and frail folks, so there could have been some misclassification. What we're calling cardiac amyloidosis might have been just bad diffuse interstitial fibrosis. But even if we call that aortic uh, cardiac amyloidosis, the signal there is bad, and we should be uh, respectful of that. There is obviously a referral bias that I had indicated before, which was kind of balanced by the selection bias. Not all patients that could get MRI that, that should have gotten MRI could get MRI, uh, presence of ICD or resynchronization therapy or a GFR below 30, obviously a contraindication for the gadolinium, in which we think that perhaps using a different method of approach should be valuable. Uh, just looking at the ECV, 
this was something interesting that the reviewer had asked and we had to add to the paper too. If we look at the ECVs, and since I think we both agree that these patients with aortic stenosis and cardiac amyloidosis, they a different disease. So our normal ECV here should be around 24 plus or minus two. This is our, we have more than 40 normal individuals, uh, myself included there too, that you know, our ECV should be around 24%. Patients with aortic stenosis have a different ECV. There is a diffuse process, even in the absence of delayed enhancement. They have an ECV of about 28 plus or minus four. You can see that the cardiac amyloidosis patients are vastly different. And they have much greater burden of that, statistically different you can see by column. So since we both agree that these patients are different, let's take them out. Let's just look at the patients with severe aortic stenosis. So patients with severe aortic stenosis, the more fibrotic you have, burden you have, the worse the survivorship. That's not new, I mean, that's fine. But look at this curve here, this black line here, which actually superimposes to this black one, a solid black. These are patients with normal CV despite severe aortic stenosis. Within 12 months, there was no event in this group. So it's not so much about the severity of aortic stenosis, it's actually how the ventricle responds to that that is going to dictate the survivorship. In such way that I would like to conclude, therefore, that using this phenotype with multimodality imaging, pre and post ever is going to be key to improve the patient selection, the timing of intervention, and the adequate result. The fibrosis by MRI appears to be a game changer, and future studies are going to be necessary to, detine, to determine whether we should intervene before its development. TH is common, and the persistency early after cover seems to be associated with the higher mortality. And whether we can modify that after we have done TAVR and the persistency of the pH still there, should we continue to investigate and perhaps treat this patient? The prevalence of cardiac amyloidosis is not uncommon. It's actually quite high, <coughs> one in six patients. And the optimal diagnostic algorithm should we consider screening for these patients beforehand since the survivorship, that needs to be sorted out and to be put into this equation. As we try to provide value care for these patients, we obviously need to understand what are they going to be the outcomes that they're going to be subjected to undergoing a costly procedure such as TAPR. This work could not be done without a lot of collaborations from other contributors at our institution as well as outside collaborators that I have had the privilege to work with. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Hear it. <laughs> Thank you. Right now, if you put on your clinic, you're seeing the patient and telling them that study you already done. Forgetting about what study is available or not available, what will you do clinically for prime time? Mm -hmm. So, first on that patient, <clears throat> I would not just ask for symptoms. You know, I would try to corroborate and objectively test that. If they can exercise, I would exercise. If they already have symptoms, then I would use, obviously, you know, the severity of aortic stenosis. Is MRI going to be beneficial in the presence of symptoms in this patient? Perhaps to indicate that we should be vigilant of how this ventricle is going to respond. So your question is much more on when you see a patient in clinic that has symptoms of severe aortic stenosis, that's already defined that we should consider intervention. <coughs> is in those patients that we're still kind of dubious, do they have symptoms that they don't have? They sometimes do not want to admit. That sometimes come through the, the granddaughter or the, the, the sister or, you know, the, the, the wife that, you know, he is here because of me, doctor, and um, he did not want to come and because they are afraid of that. So in trying to elicit symptoms from the patients, it's obviously we have learned that this is not the optical metric. So try to exercise. If they cannot exercise, I would use other parameters. We use high sensitivity troponin and BNP as one of the parameters. We look at the echocardiogram. Do they have extensive hypertrophy? Do they have already low flow phenotype? Do they have any red flags? All of those things come into mind when we're dealing with patients at that. And if they have, obviously, pulmonary hypertension, this is a high risk group that we know a priori before going into tablet that we need to be more careful with. But the vigilance should not come back at one month when they come how do you feel if you're great and you still have severe pulmonary hypertension? We've got to do something about it. I don't know. I would be very curious to know here what is the current practice, but we have instituted, based on the findings of our work, that now these patients at one month that have still persistent pulmonary hypertension, now they're being referred to the pH group, um, the, hyper, you know, the heart tail and pH group, 
as they have better means to try to address that than us. Do you guys search for that here? How, how is it usually done? Now, thanks for the question, Paul. There are three groups of patients that we use MRI uh, on a more uh, routine basis, uh, easily done. Uh, one is for patients that are referred with primary degenerative mitral regurgitation and from an outside facility that you can clearly see that this is a mid-late systolic event. Uh, there is a prolapse and then it's the mid-late systolic bisexual Doppler. And these patients are so to us as having severe MR. And sometimes it's hard to convince the referring clinician that this is not severe MR. And we do this educative, um, educative process by showing to them, hey, by MRI, the ventricles are not dilated. So it's more of a metric. The other group of patients, so that's one. The other group of patients is for patients who have ischemic secondary mitral regurgitation, patients undergoing bypass plus or minus mitral valve surgery. I think that's where we sit next to the surgeon. We bring them down to the magnet and we show them the image and say, hey, this circ here is completely gone and it's so remodeled that if you try to do a repair here, it's not going to be sustainable. That's what the CTSN network has shown. The recurrence rate seems to be related to the morphology, the geometry of that ventricle. So showing it to them, what is the sphericity? And we sit and we define what is the revascularization plus or minus intervention plan. And the third group, which is a more an emergent field, is for patients that have mitral valve prolapse and PVCs or non-sustained ventricular arrhythmias, which now some work from the Italian group of Cristina Basso and uh, uh, Salcedo has shown that the group of patients with mitral valve prolapse and delayed enhancement and fibrosis, either uh, at the basal infralateral or even at the papillary muscles, seems to be associated with a higher risk for ventricular tachycardia ventricular arrhythmia. So there's mitral valve prolapse and there is mitral valve prolapse. There's a mitral valve prolapse associated with arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death. And it seems that MRI is able to detect that annular disjunction. So the stress of the curling back and forth with the prolapse causes a lot of wall stress, and by doing that, it creates fibrosis. So this group of patients would have a low threshold to consider doing an MRI, and depending on the findings discussed as well of what we're going to do next. So those are the three groups of patients. There's a lot of, <clears throat> when I look at studies, and, and yours too, so congratulations, first of all, but um, so 10, 15% amyloidosis, 10, 15% valve thrombosis, 10, 15%. And I see that some of your studies lab tests too. And is there some phenotype, genotype that determines all of these complications? That's, I'm just wondering. No, your question I wish I would have the answer for. <laughs> uh, it's a complex one. And I would try to answer this in a different way. I don't think MRI is going to be a metric that we can use for widespread population. What I want, and this is an effort that we're trying to do with this collaboration, is to create some sort of a scoring system. Since we have identified that this replacement fibrosis is a bad player, and even a step before that, that interstitial fibrosis seems to be a bad marker, can we learn from what are the signals that we can glean from an EKG, from biomarkers, from strain, and combine an aggregate score that we, we could use in the clinic? Going back to your question, John, how we can better identify this patient and then verify that with the MRI. Once we have that validation, then we can really take this to the big masses and be more mindful on the time of intervention. Because as I've shown, 
it's not all about the aortic stenosis severity, but it's how the ventricle responds. And some of these patients might be completely fine, despite having severe AS, they're you know, still not having symptoms, which you can follow. So going back to your question, I think we need to identify this better. There are definitely signatures, and the more you look, and the more you're going to find. We're not expecting, I mean, this 16% is pretty relevant for the cardiac amyloidosis. Should we consider screening these patients? Should we withhold treatment? We don't have the answer for that, but it's only with the collaboration, because these are not common patients, collecting, and that's what we're trying to create a registry now, so that we can better learn and inform the community of how we should approach such patients. As a corollary to your observations on the gender differences in the cardiac response in men and women, did you have you seen anything uh, gender-wise with the Excellent question. So the low flow low gradient patients <clears throat> with preserved ejection fraction have been typically described as an elderly female small body size uh, with uh, this exuberant hypertrophic response. They typically have also systemic hypertension. That's one group. The other group that we're adding to the play here is this amyloidosis. So I would say in the presence of low flow low gradient preserved yes, if they are females, most likely it's just a bona fide. They will respond actually well, but they have a lot of other comorbidities. Atrial fibrillation is very common in this group of patients, and perhaps that might dictate their survivorship. We know we have learned from several groups that the paradoxical low flow low gradient, preserved EF, low flow low gradient, they tend to have worse survival than even the severe AS. Why is that? It's because they're heterogeneous groups, right? They have pH, they have HPF, they have concomitant valve disease, and by fixing the aortic stenosis, we might not fix everything. So that's why we need to be vigilant. But the other piece of it that we add is this now males. Males with mid-range, low reduced, mildly reduced PF, we have to be vigilant about cardiac amyloidosis. And I think, you know, just to, to allude to your point here, the pyrophosphate is cheap, it's ubiquitous, it's, it's a bone scan. That's how it started. Um, and now has been an excellent method to diagnose. The question is, it's not going to be a good method to track response to disease. The field of cardiac amyloidosis now is just erupting. I mean, there are lots of phase two trials now that have been approved for the mutant type of transthyretin. This is going to be two or three years from now. We're going to have a treatment for that. We're not going to use the bone scan to respond to treatment because it's not quantitative. And perhaps the ECV here might be a better metric. So more to come. But definitely they have different responses in survivorship that's dictated by the other comorbidities too. If I, uh, I did the math correctly, it was 16% for the overall group and three times in the low flow, low gradient um, uh, phenotype. Now, it, so that would be close to 40%. That's a big number. It is. And it's 40% of the population that has that phenotype being treated in the United States. So this isn't a small issue, right? I completely agree with you. Um, and the industry obviously is a little bit sensitive about that information, right. as you could imagine. Uh, but I think that it's an important thing that we need to discuss up front with the shared decision make with the patient, with the family, similar to what exactly has happened here. Once we identify the diagnosis, they said, you know, it's enough for, for grandpa, you know, and uh, let it be. Um, should we treat as a $35,000 valve, you know, for a survivorship that is that dismal? Are we diagnosing way too late? Now, now that we have more me better methods to diagnose the disease, what if we had done this? Because this cardiac amyloidosis did not happen six months ago, right? It actually might be accelerated by the stenotic valve. There are some animal studies showing that the deposition of the, the protein into the myocytes is actually worse because of the turbulence of the jet. It creates even more unfolded, more precipitation. So there might be a synergistic or a bad synergistic effect between AS and cardiac amyloidosis that really amplifies the process. Is it definitely a disease modifying? If we had the capability of diagnosing that, you know, three, four years ago and do a staging, you treat the valve and now you're going to treat the myocardium or you treat both. Or We, we need to have a better metric. It, this is, you know, fascinating in the sense that now we have identified a problem. We have a problem, you know, identifiers, but now we have to fix it with a solution. I have just one more question. Uh, the scans, the MRIs, 
uh, you showed uh, a dramatic example of modeling. Um, but is there a range of uh, involvement that's commonly seen uh, mm -hmm. of the myocardium? In the amyloidosis? Right, in the amyloidosis. Yes, uh, very good question. Yes, there is definitely a spectrum of that. And I think that's what we use, the two things. One is not only relying on the delay enhancement, but using the T1 mapping and ACVs. Patients with cardiac amyloidosis tend to definitely have a higher ACV, much greater than just pure aortic stenosis. In our center, not only the AS, but in our center, we have found a cutoff of about 38%. Once you reach that future in the cardiac amyloidosis zone, that we use the ACV. We need contrast. But in those cases that you're kind of 34 or so and you're kind of scratching your head as this really is, we use the feature tracking because we can look at the strain as well. And we see that the, the hearts with cardiac amyloidosis, and I'm sure that you have seen that, normal heart should be longitudinal and radial function, right? It goes up and down, goes up and down. The cardiac amyloidosis, the ejection fraction is preserved, but it's all radial. There's small ventricle. There's no more longitudinal function. And you can clearly see that with um, the, the, the strain. But in those patients that we kind of do because we don't know what it is and the ECV is kind of borderline high in the T1, we go for the PYP scan for the nucleus, which I think, you know, for particularly this population, might be a better metric to just say yes or no. Once you identify, then let's look into a different camera and then learn about the myocardium. RV function in these patients is also a bad player. So, you know, there's a lot to be learned.